take for granted tasks as basic as picking up a cup and taking a sip of coffee. That is, until something stops us. Hand and elbow injuries, tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. The hand, wrist, and arm make a marvelous system. They can pick up a butterfly with tenderness one moment and then pull stubborn weeds out in the garden the next. They move through a series of muscles and tendons in the forearm that create a pulley system that can be controlled within fractions of an inch. Whether performing eye surgery or throwing bales of hay to feed a horse, our arms, elbow, wrists, and hands make a world of work possible. Okay, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Carpal tunnel syndrome is typically characterized by numbness and weakness in A, the pinky finger, B, the thumb, C, the funny bone of the elbow. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of The Picture of Health. This book was written by me with a wonderful accompanying photographs by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. And remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in, but you have the whole show to call in your questions. We will answer your medical questions about hand, wrist, and elbow injuries or concerns as they are called in and sent to us via Facebook or email or call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225, 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email. Joining us, and we need your questions, so please give us those calls. Joining us tonight are Scott McPherson of Core Orthopedics, Avera Medical Group, and Robert Vandemark of Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Welcome. So, Scott, tell us a little bit about you. You're from where originally? So, I grew up uh, 30 miles west of Minneapolis. If you go up to Highway 12 and uh, take a right, go 200 miles, that was Maple Plain, Minnesota. Maple Plain. Yep. A big, big, huge city? or I think when I grew up, the name of the town was on both sides of the sign. Um, uh, it's, they're, up, they're up to a mass of 1,500 now, I think so. Oh, it's like and DeSmet. They did, and they got a stoplight. So they have one yeah, stoplight. One I don't stop think we light. have one in DeSmet yet. <laughs> did, uh, what did your folks do? So uh, my dad worked uh, construction, gas pipeline foreman, and my mom was a bank teller, but after she had kids was a stay-at-home mom. Okay. And then you went to med school at Minnesota? University of Minnesota, and uh, I had the uh, Navy pay for it. And so I, after I finished that, I got accepted to uh, orthopedic residency at the Navy Hospital in San Diego. Uh, which seemed to be a smart move coming from South you know, Dakota. Minnesota, yeah, coming in from Minnesota. Minnesota or South Dakota. South Dakota yeah. And then uh, had a little obligated service, one year as the orthopedic surgeon on Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, two years back at uh, the Navy Hospital in San Diego, and then uh, went up to UCLA and did a hand fellowship, and then was back to Minnesota for 20 years until I, I saw the light and came to a kinder, gentler place here, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, for the last three and a half years. It's been great to have you here. And Bob, you're you're um, you're come from a long line of orthopedists. Tell us a little bit well, about that. Well, I grew up in Sioux Falls. My uh, father was an orthopedic surgeon, and his brother was also an orthopedic surgeon. And their uncle Guy started practice in 1907 as an orthopedic surgeon in South Dakota. In South Dakota. In, 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 Sioux, in Falls. Sioux Falls, yeah. So you and you have a you have children that are. I have a daughter who's an anesthesiologist at uh, Avera. Scott works with her every now and then. And my son's a fifth year resident at the Mayo Clinic in Ortho. And he's gonna come and join you? Uh, eventually, we hope, yeah. He's not doing hand or anything? He's gonna do a trauma fellowship in Charlotte, North Carolina next oh, year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you have another ortho Vandemark orthopedist coming yeah. down the line. And my youngest is a dentist uh, in Rochester, Minnesota. Wow, yeah. that's great. Well, I, you know, hand, hand orthopedics is a different breed a cat than all the rest of this orthopedic stuff, isn't it? We like to think so. How, how, <laughs> how so? <laughs> well, it's a, you know, a lot of general orthopedics is uh, doing toll hips and toll knees, and this is a little bit more a finer, delicate work, I think. Uh, more a sit-down job, too, but it's, uh, it's, I think it's a lot more fun than doing general orthopedics myself. Well, I mean, you, you both told me that it's a kinder, gentler type of an orthopedist. It is. It's, you know, you're at a table, the anatomy is, you know, much 
finer, probably a little more delicate, soft tissue handling than maybe some of our, you know, general uh, orthopedic uh, burly kind of guys. And so it, uh, it's, uh, it's a fascinating anatomy and it's fun every time you do something there. I've often been blown away by the fact that the strength of the hand is from the forearm muscles. And the forearm muscles control all of these. Each little uh, part of our, our hand and our wrist and our fingers has a connection to the forearm. Right. And, uh, but then the hand has its own muscles. What are those? Uh, They're the intrinsic muscles, most of them. And most of those are uh, innervated by the ulnar nerve, the kind of the funny bone nerve. A few are the median nerve, but most are uh, small intrinsic muscles, kind of the fine motor, kind of fine tuning muscles of the hand. So you know, then they have to work in concert too. If you have just the, the extrinsics, the forearm, they, they kind of will give you kind of, you know, not very good motion unless you have them balanced with those intrinsics to really make that, so, you know, just a very sophisticated kind of uh, motion. That you can do. So what about the, uh, they say the thing that makes humans different than other animals, you know, the opposition of the, the thumb and the finger. Any comment about that? It's true. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> it's so absolutely we, We're true. the only one yeah. that can do that. Yeah. If and you, that's the intrinsic muscles of the hand, right? You know, the... Yep. the the uh, thenar muscles. Thenar muscles, yeah. yep. All right. So um, if, you hurt, if you hurt your thumb, you realize why we have thumbs. Yeah. I, I, you know, and a lot of people have thumb problems. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Uh, a lot of people have thumb arthritis. That's probably what I, we mostly see, I think. Really, and what do you do for it? I mean, well, do, is there an variety. orthopedic answer besides? Well, yeah, there are a variety of things. You can do medication, some therapy, splints, injections, but surgery. So. Surgery. What's the sur Let's talk about the surgery for, because I've seen so many people with this, you know, you touch them at the base of their thumb and they just, or at the base of the. Yeah, you're absolutely, it's right there. You know, it's still, you, you know, you pretty much within five seconds, you know, they have arthritis at the base of their thumb and the pain is right there. And if you take it and you grind it, the, that, the surgery basically consists of taking the the bone just below the, the metacarpal here, the, the base bone is about the size of a little dice cube called the trapezium. Almost every surgery involves just taking that out and then figuring out some way just to to support the thumb so it doesn't, you know, collapse. And there's really a variety of ways that people do it. And it's because they all tend to have a pretty favorable, you know, thing in our profession. If it, if, if there's a lot of things, ways to do something, it's because they all work well or none of them work well. This is one where they all tend to work yeah. pretty well. So a lot, that's one orthopedic hand surgery that people who have, who are really suffering could really do something about. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a take home message worth remembering. It is, and a lot of people come in and go, I didn't know that you could do anything about it, and all of a sudden, well, you know, here it is, and I, those are some of, I think, most gratifying patients, exactly. because, yeah. you know, all day they're using their thumb, it's aching, it's painful, and all of a sudden they tend to have a relatively pain-free thumb with good mobility and functional strength, they're, they're happy people. I've often thought that a lot of hand problems are related to the fact that we abuse our hands like crazy. I mean, I've found myself using it as a hammer, trying to do things. I mean, is, why do people get that arthritis of the thumb? I mean, is there a reason? Uh, it's more common in women than men. No one knows why. Uh, some of my patients say because women work harder than men, yeah. which may be true. <laughs> uh, something to do with the slope of the trapezium, too, is different than women and men, but I don't think it What's really the trapezium? One of the bones the of bone, the wrist? They take the bone out, yeah, a little at the base of the thumb. All right. So what I usually tell them, you know, the, the joint is kind of like a, a saddle joint. And if our thumbs only went like that, it would be fine, but they're always going like that. And cartilage, which is like the Teflon coating on a fry pan, yeah. doesn't like shear. And if you keep shearing, and, and you know, if you pinch here with like 10 pounds of force, it puts 120 pounds of force through the base of your thumb to stabilize that thumb. And I always think that the women maybe have a little more problem because their joints are a little smaller, a little higher contact force, plus maybe a little more ligamentous laxity so they get more shear. So they get it about a four to one ratio than the, than the guys do. But they barely work four times so harder too. So. And they work harder. Yeah. No. Okay. Let's not argue that way. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> women from Brookings. I, woman from Brookings, I have a history of carpal tunnel and I am experiencing frequent symptoms. When do you suggest making the call to set up an appointment and consult for surgery? So. What is carpal tunnel syndrome? Uh, it's a compression of the median nerve uh, at the wrist, and usually people get numbness in their thumb, index, middle finger, and half of the ring finger. So I, I guess we could get to the median nerve. We were just talking about the base of the thumb and 
That's there, right there. Yep, trapezium. That, yep. Trapezium. And now we're talking about carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, the, car, the, 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 there is a, a, t, uh, a, a fascia that goes around here. Uh, tell, yeah, what, tell me. I think there might be a better picture. Okay, let's go to the next picture. Yeah, I don't want to tell you what to do, but. There we go, that's All much right. better. Oh. I can okay. run this, yeah. yeah. So this is the carpal ligament right here, and beneath that runs the median nerve and. The, you can see it, and oh no, those are tendons. Yeah, the flexor tendons are the white things beneath it. Yeah. But the nerve would be pretty much right underneath there. All right, and so, uh, of course, you can put them in a wrist splint so they don't overwork it, particularly at night, because sometimes they'll sleep like this, right? Correct. Or, and the carpal tunnel will get better. Or you can inject it with steroids. What else do you do? Or where is the surgery? What would you do with the surgery? Uh, the surgery is uh, basically right over the carpal ligament. And you, there are a couple of different ways to do it, but the whole idea is just to release the carpal ligament to take the pressure off the nerve. And there are a variety of different ways to do it. You can do it endoscopically or do it open. All right, so I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna erase this, and I'm gonna give you. So tell us again. Oh, draw, sure. draw again. Yeah. So incision kind of runs just about here. It's not quite that big, but you can uh, do it endoscopically. Uh, Which means people, with a scope. With a scope, yeah. And the results are the same if you do it open or endoscopic. Uh, and it's a pretty predictable operation as far as pain relief. Now, the, uh, some say, you, well, you need to do these studies to prove that you have it, or do, or do you? You just have this. You just have the history. That's enough. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a little bit of a debate. So, um, uh -huh. you know, I spent, like I said, one year in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I think hard and long before I'd send somebody 2,000 miles for you know the electrical diagnostic testing. So my his I, and I, the way my training was, we're all maybe a little experiences of our training. If if somebody has a classic history and they have classic findings, um, why order an expensive test that I don't think is going to change the management or help me with it? Now, if it's somebody that I'm not sure, maybe is it a carpal tunnel or is it a neck problem or do they have a, like a diabetic neuropathy on top of this and I need more information, then, then I might use it. Or uh, if it's workers' compensation, the statutes almost always require you to get oh, really? a, a positive electrical oh, wow. diagnostic testing or confirm. If that's negative, you can confirm it with a uh, positive result with a uh, corticosteroid injection in the carpal tunnel. Oh. Yeah, so there it's kind of dictated to you. Yeah, the, uh, the British don't do... The, the what? The British. The yeah. British don't the even UK, do it. No, they they, they do the surgery. Now the question I would have, uh, so they don't do the testing, they just no. do the surgery. Just like Scott was saying, yeah. That's... yeah. Well, well, and before we go on, uh, if you don't fix it early enough, people lose their muscles permanently, right? So right. you don't want to live with this, right? I mean, when is the time that people should come to you and have this surgery? So like, I mean, going to this lady's question here. So if you're starting to have like night waking symptoms, uh, the first thing usually people do is they'll try the night splints so they don't sleep with their wrists flexed, which puts about four times the pressure on the nerve, and oftentimes that makes the symptoms go away. But I tell people when it's interfering with your activities of daily living or your night sleep pattern, then it's, I think, a good time to come and see somebody, confirm the diagnosis, and then uh, treatment options. And the natural history for carpal tunnel tends to be progressive. It's caused by the fact that those nine tendons, as we age, tend to thicken up, take up more space, like just putting too many things in your closet at home, it keeps getting fuller, and that pushes that nerve up against the ligament. And so it may wax and wane, but it continues to, to get worse. So when it gets enough where it's bothering you, I usually suggest do the carpal tunnel, be done with it, and you know you should. And the, the the success rate, like Bob says, it's 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 highly successful, 95 to 97 percent if they meet good uh, surgical criteria. Yeah, I think the night pain is what drives them crazy. Yeah, they really. can't sleep at night. Yeah, yeah. Also brings most people in, I think. Yeah, and it's a permanent solution. Usually. Typically. Uh, and, if, and it's preventive of yeah. a permanent loss. I usually tell people about two percent recurrence rate. Yeah. Is about in the literature. Okay. Uh, it isn't uncommon for a football player to break a bone during a game with the hits and tackles they go through. But for most of us, a broken bone arrives when we least expect it and from the most mundane of circumstances. I was riding my bike back from uh, the post office. I went to go get the mail for work. 
I was on the sidewalk and I turned on the sidewalk and when I turned I went onto the grass a little bit and as I was trying to come back onto the sidewalk it was a spot where the dirt had settled so my bike tipped over and when it tipped over you know instinctually I wanted to stick out a straight arm and the straight arm impacted and the force went up the ulna and it shattered the uh, distal humerus and immediately I could not move it very well so I called my brothers and had them come grab me and I went to the clinic and at that point all they did was splint me up and uh, took x-rays and I was referred to an orthopedic surgeon. But I was amazingly calm. I mean it hurt a little bit but it was, I more so went into uh, I need to figure out the next step. I didn't want to move it on my own. I wanted to have someone examine it before I tried forcibly moving it back and forth or you know, I thought about like, should I try to straighten it? But I decided just to support the weight best I could until an x-ray could be taken and they could tell me whether or not it was damaged and if it was safe or not to move. I ultimately wanted to go see a general orthopedic surgeon. They were the ones that said, this is quite serious and you'll need to see a hand surgeon to have it done. That was on Percocet afterwards, um, which helped manage the pain uh, because they really wanted me to move it uh, right away and keep the range of motion up and that was the most painful part uh, just trying to get it to move um, at home it wasn't too bad I mean you had to adjust to moving things one-handed and it was a lot for me personally it was a lot easier to have my little brother and my mom around otherwise I live in an apartment by myself um, I'm sure I could have managed, but given I can work remotely for the most part, it uh, was helpful having someone to move stuff around the house and help me out with uh, tasks that would otherwise be very difficult with one arm. So that's Aaron Peterson, who is, uh, works with us on uh, Healing Words uh, Foundation. He's, he works with us, and it's great that he was willing to do this uh, type of a thing. And thank you for sharing your story, Aaron. So let's talk about this fracture. This is the, the picture we have of his uh, clinic picture of the fracture. Show us where the fracture is, Scott. Yeah, so Aaron came in with this fracture, and the, you know, the Plain x-rays look pretty, uh, yeah, pretty they benign. Look, they, they, don't, look, they, they look, you kind of look at them, you and say, well, not a big deal. If you look, here's kind of the fracture line, probably right through here. Um, but you can see it probably a little bit better when we move to the laterals, the side view, and now you can see that fracture line coming through here. But the way to really kind of assess these better um, is if you go on to get a and here you can see it again a little bit better there, but to get a CT scan, Gotta which punch is, it a bunch. I will get right there, is, uh, so this is a CT scan where this is like taking cuts like you put your arm now in the, the table saw and it kept kind of slicing it uh, through. All of this are, this is the fracture fragment, 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 fragment. That's the humerus. The, the, the end of is the humerus bone, yep. That's this the is the outside bone. of it, yep, should be here. That should all be just one piece around here like that. So here's just another example again. Here's the outside end of the humerus bone, but look at all this crack here, crack there, extension there. So now if we look at it right from the, the side view, here you can see this fracture line going through the end of the the end of the humerus here. That's the part that, that makes the arm move hinged up and down like that. And as you move across, it keeps taking sections. You can see how displaced this whole thing, you know, should be up here, and this should be matching up to there. And a joint is like, a, you know, putting a piston in a cylinder. If it's offset, it might run for a while, but it's going to wear out on you. And so here again shows you how much this piece here should be back up on top of it more like that. So it's a uh, and then one more view right from the straight front taking cuts through it. You can see the fracture and Oof. here how much it's, it's punched. This should be kind of coming right along here like that. So uh, an innocent looking x-ray and a, a bad looking CT scan and the job is to get this uh, uh, situated such that it uh, lines it back up again. So 
Yeah, and this. here's a kind of example then what you do is you have to to expose this, you usually cut this bone right here, you flip this out of the way, and then you can get to the joint surface and line it up and put these plates and screws on it, then you have to fix that bone that you have made, get it out of the way. Here's the front view of it again, so here's the uh, uh, fracture line through here. This is a different example, but same kind of hardware. It's one plate on one side, one the other side, and, and screws across that joint surface to line it up, get it lined up back where it belongs, and then fix that bone you, you took down to, um, uh, to expose the joint there. When you get one of these, you just kind of know, whenever I leave the house for one of these, I just tell my wife this is, you know, this is four hours. It's like it's four a, hours out of your life. <laughs> so, any, any comment, Bob? No, tough fracture. Yeah, that and is. why did it happen? I mean, a lot of people when they come down, they break at the wrist instead of at the elbow. Why did his, why did he not break at the? So it's just where the force kind of, you know, transmits, so maybe hit with a pretty neutral wrist, but then that, that bone, the forearm bone there just acts like a wedge and that it will just, it goes up there and just splits, you know, kind of punch that in there. So it oftentimes just depends on the angle your arm was at and where that force finally has to exit. And you're right, most of the time we catch our hands so we go back here and the most common upper extremity injury is the, the colleagues fracture, the distal radius fracture because your wrist only goes back so far and that breaks but uh, you know it could be the, the scaphoid or it could be the forearm or it could be here or your, you know, your humerus, it's just where right. that maximum force tends to exit. Speak about the colleagues fracture one, one quick bit, the silver uh, fork deformity, is that the right? Uh, Close. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's a pretty common thing, much more common in older uh, patients than younger patients. Uh, it, I think the whole treatment now has been kind of changed since we have new implants to fix the fractures. In the past, it was sort of a hit and miss, kind of a potpourri of different things, and now you can put a nice plate on the distal radius and, and get the patients moving a lot quicker. And, and someone did a study showing that the patients who had the best looking x-rays had the best results. They got that published. And that's and, and that's it, true. It's true. Yeah. So the silver fork, so this is the silver fork, and then the, this is the, so this is the hand, and there's this deformity that, that it moves forward so that the, 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 you know, would you draw it any different? No, that's no, good. That's, and, and so uh, this is the palm of the hand, and then this is the forearm, and this deformity here is the silver fork deformity, yeah. that's because it breaks there. And yep. the bone is so, it's like an eggshell, the bone's very hard on the outside, but usually there's not much bone inside, so once you crack that outer shell, there's nothing to support it. And particularly if, you have, if you're an older person, not using a lot of weights, not working you know, physically very hard anymore, and there right. it is. Um, okay, so uh, let's take some questions. Six-year-old, two-year-old woman, Let's do, okay, let's start here. Suffering a fracture is painful and interferes with normal daily life, but sometimes the therapy that follows that is designed to ensure the best restorative outcome can be an additional challenge. So I have full rotation in the uh, wrist, uh, so the therapy was focused uh, exclusively on flexion and extension of the elbow. Age is always a factor. Usually, generally, the younger you are, the the better off you are in terms of your recovery. Um, and then just the nature of the injury. You know, in this case, an elbow injury, there's a million different ways you can injure your elbow. Um, did it require surgery? Did it not require surgery? Is there a fracture involved, a dislocation? A fracture and a dislocation. Is there hardware involved with the surgery? Um, so it's really hard to say there, those are the kinds of variables that, that can affect the outcome. Um, but the outcomes can, can and do vary and the expectations can and do vary um, depending on all those things, like I say, age and, and the complexity of the injury. So you'd have me put the arm on the table and the point is just to re-engage the muscle. After the surgery, you lose muscle memory. So everything from him pulling on the towel and forcing me to work pushing against him or pulling against him? Well, and the treatment is a progression. You know, right now, the primary goals are movement. We're trying to increase the range of motion at the elbow. As time goes by, as that motion gets better, as the healing progresses, then strength is gonna become more of an issue in the treatment as well. And we'll have to work on 
you know, restoring strength to the muscles that, that power that joint. Part of the regimen uh, initially was using a CPM machine, continuous passive motion. Uh, as you could guess, there's passive motion and it's active for, motion. This is good up to a certain The point. passive motion and is you, you would just sit there and it would passively move it. Uh, that's just to keep the do, soft tissue loose. Yeah, now I do active exercises. Uh, as you do like it, as you're not engaging the muscles itself. I would typically do four sessions for an hour each. I did that for, I believe, the first two months. And after that, I moved to strictly active motion. The active motion is where I am engaging the muscles to try to improve the extension and flexion. At any age, you don't want to lose a range of motion, but particularly at the age of 25, I would prefer not to lose an extensive amount of range of motion. Uh, I look at even though the last four months and probably an additional uh, six months to a year of therapy is and working on it my own is going to be rather difficult. I would prefer to put in uh, the time now and not and have as close to full range of motion back as possible for the rest of my life. Well, we appreciate Aaron doing that for us. And I have, you know, we, uh, people in the studio suggested that we give him a hand or maybe an elbow for his, his work there. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I, what, how important is, is physical therapy and occupational therapy in rehabbing a person? Bob? Uh, it's probably more important than the surgery sometimes, I think. Uh, they really make us look good. Do they? Yeah, it's just, uh, it's amazing. I know that there are people who have knee surgery, and if you don't get them moving, they will have chronic pain. It's the movement that hurts initially that breaks them from the pain cycle. So when I used to teach residents, I tell them a perfect surgery and outcome is 100 points. You get four points for patient selection, five points for your surgery, and five points for your rehab, and you multiply them together. So, you know, like if your rehab's a zero, you're like zero, especially uh, things like flexor tendon repairs. So therapy dependent elbow injuries where the elbow doesn't take a joke, it stiffens up, it's tight, and you need that trained person to really work with them on a fairly regular basis to get that optimal outcome. You know, interesting, you, uh, you four points for the the perfect patient. Yeah, well, and, just so it comes out to 100, but I, yeah. I, gave, I only gave them four, so. <laughs> but, you know, if you look at what he's done, I mean, he, he came to work after he went to the clinic and had the x-ray, you put in a splint, came to work, I mean, he was, it was a night on where we were having a, a television show. I can't remember which. And he was there the whole night, you know. And then it hurt. You know, it hurt him. And I know that this whole thing has hurt him a lot. Yep. But I don't hear a lot of complaints. So <laughs> that's kind of a four point for that guy. That's right. Let's go to the story. 62-year-old woman from Eureka with surgery for carpal tunnel. How long are people unable to use their wrist? And will they have the ability to use their wrist in the same way before the surgery? Well, my post-op regimen, it's, uh, it's about a 10-minute operation. I do mine open, and then afterwards, soft dressing. I tell them they're going to move their thumb fingers immediately. They can use it for normal routine use right away, eating, writing, driving, texting, keyboarding, and, and just kind of increase it as it feels comfortable. I usually tell them if they're kind of heavy, intense work, about six weeks before you're ready to put a you know, roof on your garage or something like that, yeah. but uh, they should get back full wrist mobility by about three months, they should max back out on their grip strength. If they haven't had some significant loss. Yeah. It's amazing how it's all changed because when I started practice on Sir Scott's gate, we put people in casts for yeah. two weeks. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And so of course now you have this illness because you've had surgery. So now it's like a big deal as opposed to now, you know, band-aids next couple of days, do what you want to. Uh, yeah. If it hurts, don't do it. Right. Yeah. I, I heard uh, this is kind of like radial head uh, fractures. You know, the radius is the big bone at the wrist, and it's small at the elbow. The ulna is big at the elbow and small at the wrist. So the radial head, they break at the radius, so it's hard to do the rotation thing. Um, and there's no surgery to do. You just Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you just got to get them moving or they'll lose mo motion. And, it depends. I mean, if it's a non-displaced or minimally displaced, early motion, you know, you hold them maybe three, four, five days and tell them start moving it. If it's displaced, 
uh, then you may go in and fix it to make that joint surface uh, congruent. Or if it's just shattered, you can take it out. And if the, able, uh, the elbow stable put in nothing, or nowadays most people put in a, a radial head replacement kind of implant. So it just depends on how bad the, the fracture and if there's other associated injuries with that, it. That's advancement since I was done with my yep. that's newer yep. stuff. Yep. Yep. Back you know, when I started, it was you just, you just took it out, and that was it. You were done. There we go. Um, so a 77-year-old from Sioux Falls wondering about joint replacements for knuckles in the fingers. Bob? Uh, they can be done. It kind of depends on what the problem is. Is it osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, Either one you could do the knuckles on. You can. Uh, it kind of depends. Uh, the PIP joints, the middle joints of the fingers, are a little bit tougher to do than the big joints of the fingers. The MCP joints. Uh, so the, the MC is the knuckle. Right. But the uh, the PIP, PIP is the, yeah. the middle, yep. and they're harder as it goes out. And of course, you don't do anything with the distal. Uh, the tiny. Well, some people have tried, uh, they, but usually yeah. not. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so normally if it's the end joint that gets kind of, let's say, angled, deviated, painful, then you fuse that joint. And when you look at your you know, motion between these two joints, 85% comes from your PIP and only 15% here. So a stable DIP joint that's non-painful is very functional and people don't miss it quite a bit. But the PIP is where you need the, the motion and... 85% on the PIP, if, which is these. The yep, middle joints. Yep. The middle joints. So that's the critical one to keep moving. But uh, like Bob said, those there are joint replacements. Sometimes it's, it's high reward, high risk, because they can work very well, but if they kind of fail on you, then it's kind of... Um, problematic and you wind up usually then having to fuse the joint in a stable position. I have a friend whose distal finger, I can't remember which is, he comes up and then it just goes out at a 45 degree angle. Do you ever fix those or you just leave them? If it's painful or not? No. No. I'd leave it. Leave it if, if it doesn't bother but if it's functionally a problem, that would be yeah. something you'd fuse. You just bring it into a proper alignment and, and fuse it into a better functional position. All right. A 67-year-old uh, from Lake Preston, motorcycle accident caused boot to near fingers and two fingers. What can I do with this? She should see Bob. <laughs> so Bob? Because <laughs> there's no good treatment for that. No, they're, they're hard. Give they're problem. Every card with you. Boot and So boot and near, you know, of course. Tell her what to do, Bob. Yeah. So here is a boot and near. I've got a, I don't even have one in this. Yeah, okay, so here's where you put your boot and near, you know, your, your flower. Stick it through the hole. That's a boutonniere right here. Yeah, and the, so, French, the French call it the buttonhole deformity. Oh, is that right? <laughs> so we call it the French yeah. name, the French call it the yeah. buttonhole. So explain what it is. Uh, there's a t uh, tendon, extensor tendon that goes on the back of your finger to that middle joint, that PAP joint. Okay, so about. it's right here. It's right. On, and and it gets ruptured, so that allows the tendon to drop down, finger drop this way. And then the other two tendons on the back of your finger are called lateral bands, and that it causes hyperextension of the end joint, so it's a real problem. So yeah, here's and, your boutonniere. Yeah. yeah so it's this, yep. it's this kind of a thing. It right. is. It is. And you can see that the bands go across, so there's a central depression that looks like the boutonniere right. hole. That's where it's popped out. And the problem is people can't make a fist. Oh, they can't. Because the end joint's so hyperextended, they can't get to their palm. So what? How do you do? What do you do to fix it? Uh, usually, uh, surgery is uh, not the answer. Uh, <laughs> it's been tried. Uh, so you usually do a therapy program to try to get your finger out in extension, and then try to mobilize the, the lateral bands. Wouldn't you be better if you just froze it at a at a physiologic half bent position? Actually, what what you'll do sometimes is if this is the main problem that hyperextension, you'll just go and cut the, the, the tendon band. on top a little bit to kind of rebalance it. And that does work pretty good for them getting back better motion. So uh, you'll try splinting this. On rare occasions, I've tried to you know, kind of do a reconstruction, but it's just such a hard balancing act. And after every time I do it, I kind of say, this is, might did, be the last time I'll why try Why did this. I do that? Yeah. But the, just releasing that terminal tendon to get this out of that hyperextension, so that seems to work pretty well for people. Motorcycle accident. That's the question that I would have. Uh, of course, we're not going to say anything negative about motorcycles. <laughs> no, they're but do you, um, 67 years old. Huh? Yeah? Good for him. Good for him. Do you have any comment about or motorcycles <laughs> and or safety with motorcycles or is that recommendations? Uh, I think riding a bike is dangerous. So Riding a bike is the first yeah. most dangerous accidental yeah. deal. And people should be wearing helmets, they say. They should be wearing helmets. Motorcycles, you know, should be 
wearing helmets, obviously, yeah. but uh, I, the Navy Hospital in San Diego was, we had a whole right open now. bay of motorcycle riders, the enlisted guys in San Diego, that was, they all had motorcycles and they would, you know, have their accidents. So it's, uh, you know, I, it's, it's a great instrument to get around. It's a, you know, great fun, but un unfortunately you can it carries, be, it carries okay. risk. And even if you're doing the world's best job on it, you're still, you know, at risk. So it's yeah. just uh, no good answer. If you're gonna ride it, you're just There's at risk. risk. Anything correct, uh, arthritic fingers, Anything to correct arthritic fingers where the joints have been enlarged. A lot of people, osteoarthritis, inflammatory osteo, they have these big sort of like the hands of the Wicked Witch of the West. You know, what, what do you recommend for those big fat joints? Uh, paraffin bath is good. Uh, they can do that. Uh, Anti-inflammatories, uh, there's really not much Surgically. surgically to do it. Yeah. Surgically, if it becomes the joint becomes you know arthritic and painful, yeah. then that's an indication to fuse the joint, which you'll you'll get rid of the big nodules and you'll straighten it out. Uh, but then you, you know, can't bend it. But you can't bend it. But right. most of the time, by the time they get there, they're not they bending bend it much it. Any, no. anyway. But if you try to just go in there and you know, like people want you to just take off those big knobby things and they they just come back and now you have a scar in a knobby area, yeah. so yeah. it's it's not usually worth it. Somebody from Martin said, why would the surgeon operate at the elbow for a carpal tunnel syndrome? Bob? Well, uh, I'm not sure if they're talking about actually median nerve at the elbow. Uh, there is an operation, they call it, it's a syndrome called the pronator syndrome. It can cause carpal tunnel-like symptoms. But the problem is that the median nerve is caught somewhere in the elbow, right. not, at the, right. not at the carpal tunnel. I assume that's what we're talking about. And the other thing, of course, is the cubital tunnel is the ulnar nerve at the elbow. More so common. the funny bone, Right. Probably named after the humerus. I don't yeah, know. Not funny, not a bone. Not funny no. at all. It's the nerve <laughs> that the nerve. cranks right through this part of the elbow yeah. and it comes down, enervates the fifth finger and the half of the fourth. Yeah. That's not elbow carpal tunnel syndrome. No, no but they may have, yeah, so they may have just spoken and said Maybe. carpal when they meant to say cubital because they're both tunnel syndromes and uh, carpal tunnel, the most common, cubital tunnel, the second most common oh, wow. uh, nerve the compression. Nerve. Yep. That's called a cubital tunnel. Cubital tunnel, tunnel from uh, Latin, cubitali, where they, those pillows that they would rest on. Were the, yeah, I've about never that. heard that. I've, you know, I've, <laughs> I thought I knew everything. <laughs> so what do you release the nerve and just take it out and just put it outside in the? You know, there's a pendulum on that of just freeing it up versus uh, moving it to the front versus actually taking off that knuckle of bone. But I think most people, and what, what I do is I just free it. I just release the tight bands like doing a carpal tunnel and, and that seems to work well. Sometimes though, because of the environment or previous trauma, you might be better off moving it to the front of the elbow to get rid of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, vermilion, carpal tunnel syndrome, but the thumb still hurts. Is there anything else that can be done? I would guess that it's not just carpal, that the guy's got arthritis of the thumb and it should be fixed. And commonly when you release the carpal ligament, it's not strange to have more pain in the CMC joint. In the push joint? The, the carpal and the carpal joint, the trapezium, because the uh, carpal ligament has been released, now the bones kind of rotate a bit, so there's more stress at the base of the thumb. Oh, so that's not uncommon. No. Uh, but what do you do for it? Uh, treat her for, for the CMC joint arthritis. Right, yep. and take the surgery as we talked earlier. If you know, maybe a splint, steroid injection. The other thing people can have that causes the thumb that goes along with carpal tunnel is like a trigger thumb, where the tendon you know, is thickened and it doesn't glide through the pulley very well there. So that's kind of the same uh, pathology that causes carpal tunnel is the same thing for people to get those trigger fingers where they kind of lock down or sometimes it doesn't lock completely but every time the tendons gliding through there it's kind of rubbing against that pulley it goes through and that can and give th and yeah and I, you'll see that occasion too where people have their carpal tunnel release and all of a sudden a few weeks later they start getting their their thumb trigger symptoms so yeah. it might so they need a diagnosis is what they need mm -hmm. and then decide how to treat it do you, it's, let's talk about trigger fingers because a lot of people do have them I sent one uh, to a, uh, a hand surgeon just the other day. Uh, she has, a, and it looks like it might be fixed. I, I don't know if she can ever straighten it. She t thinks that she can, and then she showed me how she used it, holding a glass with it fixed, uh, stuck uh, in this position. Do you repair all of them? Uh, you know, I was in the meeting last week and, and talking to a surgeon from Canada, and they have a seven month wait to get your trigger fingers done and half the patients got better without surgery. Oh, is that? <laughs> yeah, 
But I think the people who need something done are ones who can't get full extension right. because they, they develop a flexion contracture, especially if they have it for a long period of time. I mean, you can try a cortisone shot, but I think that's the, it's time to probably do some surgery yeah. for it. And if they get a flexion contracture, you can release that too, right? uh, Usually the PIP joint will still be stuck in flexion. But you, with some therapy or work on it, they usually can get it stretched out, or you could go. Usually it's not enough to warrant like a surgical no. procedure, but somebody locked down like that, if you go in and release that pulley where it's stuck, they'll get their motion back and they'll have a good result. If you get it soon enough. Mm -hmm. Even if they stay down for a while, you'll probably still you're, improve, but you're right, you may wind up with a bit of a PIP contracture there. 82-year-old uh, man from Rapid City is a type 2 diabetic and a wood carver. In the evenings, his hands will fall asleep off and on. What could be the cause of this? So probably carpal tunnel, and he may also have a diabetic neuropathy, but those two can yeah. superimpose upon each other. But it, it's still worthwhile if it is the carpal tunnel and it's causing night symptoms, night waking, numbness, tingling. Typically getting the pressure off the nerve will take care of that component, and they'll feel better. Yeah, the old teaching has been that if you have a diabetic neuropathy, you should not do carpal tunnel. And one of the guys in Rochester, I was there, looked up a series of one year of carpal tunnel patients in diabetics, and 85% said they'd do it again. They'd have the surgery. Yeah. I, I, last week, I had a neurologist on, and we asked that question about neuropathy, and I said, hand numbness, it could be diabetic neuropathy. Uh, and he said, it's almost always in the feet and last in the hands, and so you have to realize the neuropathies have got to be significant in the feet before they'll get to the hand. Um, via email, 72-year-old from here, and I crochet quite a bit and have my entire life. My left wrist is starting to get twinges just below the palm on the left wrist, sort of to the outside. That area seems to be thicker than the right side. Will a brace help? I don't really want to quit crocheting. That's interesting. And do uh, you have any clues? The left wrist, thicker on the right side. Did you get that? I don't quite understand what it means. So I'm just wondering if maybe she's getting a little, you know, like palmar fibromatosis, like Dupuytren's. Mm -hmm. um, the twinges certainly could be, you know, maybe early, you know, carpal tunnel or something like that. But but the, if you see thickness on the palm of the hand, Dupuytren's contracture is a real deal. Yeah. T tell me about that, Scott. So Dupuytren's contracture on the, you know, our palm side of her hand, it's nice and tough because right underneath the skin we have that kind of that canvassy layer known as the palmar fascia. And that's why, our, you know, we can hands stand up and do things and can hit and they don't glide much. If here, you know, your skin goes all over the place here, it's pretty fixed. But for whatever reason, oh. that fascia will start to get a signal where it starts to replicate itself, beef itself up, forms these cordials, and then sometimes even uh, or nodules, and then they, they form these cords out onto the fingers that can start to draw the. And it's generally the fifth down, and then it's the fourth. Yep, those are the most common. That. Can and 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 it's it's um, there's nothing you can do about it until it if it gets I call it the tabletop test. If it gets bad enough, we used to operate on them and try to take it all out. We found that didn't work. They still come back. So then we just try to do limited surgery. Now uh, in our armamentarium is the Zyflex, an enzyme that's pretty specific for the that tissue, so you can inject it and and to kind of dissolve that cord and then break it apart so you can get the finger straight. Still doesn't make all the stuff go away, but it, if people those fingers are straight, they should be, you know, should be happy with it. Yeah. I learned that from Vandemark last time he was here that it isn't, has nothing to do with the cords that come from the forearm. It has all to do with that fashion. Yeah, yeah. Palm. And that now you're doing more of the enzymes? Yeah, the enzyme's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. So if you're, I generally say, if you can put your hands in your pocket, I kind of prefer that to the yep. table time. Yep. Slide them in the top pocket. Pockets, you're okay, but get your you, gloves on. <laughs> get your gloves on. That's right. But uh, in this case, don't stop crocheting because that's probably not causing any of the no. the problems. It's just maybe manifesting your symptoms, but um, the crocheting isn't harming anything. It's the most important thing that you can do is to keep using those yeah, joints. Yeah, keep using the hands. How effective is gabapentin in treating the initial stages of carpal tunnel? And what are the best hand arm exercises? if you're on the computer all day? So in my experience, gabapentin is not helpful for carpal tunnel because it's a compressive neuropathy, pressure on the nerve, and I haven't found that that's been overly effective. It's more when it's kind of that smaller nerve kind of like a diabetic neuropathy or um, a reflex sympathetic dystrophy pain syndrome type thing. So for pain carpal syndrome. tunnel, I, I haven't found that to be useful. Uh, if you're on the computer all the day, and, and that's a bit of a, a misnomer, people think 
computer keyboard causes work causes carpal tunnel. No studies, in, in fact, all studies indicate that keyboard users in the general population are exact same. As uh, the non-keyboard users. Yeah, non-keyboarders. So yeah. it's, there's no real relationship. It may make you manifest your symptoms, but like people get carpal tunnel at night and I don't think sleeping causes yeah, you know, no. carpal tunnel. Yeah. So, um, but it's, it's you know, stretches, take breaks, uh, make sure you're not pounding too hard, have you know, good arm position. Um, it just try to be kind of smart about it. Sometimes yeah. you can see a therapist, they can give you some kind of ergonomic advice on how to set up your station, how to you know, kind of posture yourself well to kind of avoid those things. But yeah. some of it be too, you, you're gonna have carpal tunnel in it, you're gonna have it if you keyboard or you don't keyboard. Yeah, yeah. So. You, you use gabapentin much? Uh, a little bit, but most of the people I see who need surgery are on gabapentin. Already? Yeah, so. And I, it's, it's an anti-seizure drug, and it'll bring you down a notch. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a tranquilizer, so you're never more alert on it. You're yeah. less alert. Yep. It's fascinating. The history of carpal tunneling was first described like in 1846, and they called it acroparesthesia then. And, and that was long before there were you know, computers and mouse and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it I, wasn't the computer. I told my patients that, and some think that's nice, and some don't think it's so nice. But it's, <laughs> that's it's, good. It's, it's true. A uh, 70 year old woman who have, having swelling at the end of my right elbow a couple of weeks. <clears throat> Not red or limited motion of the arm, but there's this elbow swelling and tenderness. Uh, not that tender, but uh, what about the treatment at the end of the elbow? There's a lot of causes, of course. Sounds to me like she's describing an uh, electronon bursitis where you get the bursal sacs gotten a little inflamed and swollen and most of the time do nothing or pat, put a pad on it, put an ace wrap to protect it, try not to irritate it. And, and it's why they, they yeah. generally do it because they've been doing a lot of this. Yep. Mm -hmm. give, it a, give it a few give it weeks a and it may get better now. If it's hot, yeah. if it's red hot, I've had a number of them get turned and hot. It, and it could be gout, but um, only probably if you've had a history of gout, you know, somewhere else. You can but. have rheumatoid nodules, you can have gouty nodules. Mm -hmm. Any other comment? And if you can have an infected bursitis, but those, yeah. do you put they, they ramp up quick and you, did, you're going to know it. Do so. either of you put needles and inject those? You generally leave Very them alone. Rarely, <laughs> rarely, rarely do I try to uh, cortisone. No. Quickly now, ulnar surgery one year ago because of numbness in my little finger and shrinkage of the muscle, so he had ulnar neuropathy, this cubital. And, and atrophy, so very advanced. Uh, no improvement in either, still had a chance of some improvement. Should you do it? it? Sounds like he has enough symptoms. Yes? So he had the surgery already a year ago. Oh, and he had the surgery. But, yeah. but he still has chance for improvement because what I tell people too is, you know, your nerve, if it's kind of been, if it's out, you know, it's been squeezed hard enough where it's not working anymore, then it has to sometimes just regrow itself. Well, nerves go at about an inch per month. So if you do the math from your, you know, elbow to your fingertips, you know, you can get maybe some improvement for up to a couple years or so. And the other thing that's helpful though is even if you don't see much improvement, hopefully you get it from getting worse because most of the time if you don't do something, it's just gonna okay. progressively get worse. But right. it, they can be problematic. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question, carpal tunnel syndrome is typically characterized by numbness and weakness in the A, pinky finger, B, thumb, C, the funny bone of the elbow, and the answer is B, the thumb, and also includes the second pointer finger, the third middle finger, and sometimes the inside of the half of the fourth finger. It was Susan Brown from Oldham who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Susan. I wonder if she's the same Susan Brown that grew up with me in DeSmet. Thanks for <laughs> participating, and a book will be on the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. You still feeling lousy, sweetheart? Terrible. Day four of aches, chills, sweats. Oh, poor thing. You're just not you when you have the flu. I don't feel like me at all. Do I look sick? You look different. Oh, you're so sweet. Mm. That's not your pretty face. Feel like yourself. Get vaccinated because stopping the flu starts with you. The runner was facing traffic coming down a steep switchback asphalt road after a recent rain. As he came around a tight corner, he slipped just as an approaching car was turning into him. He caught himself with the palm of his hand and in that split second that counts, cranked down hard on that wrist in order to avoid slipping under the car. After the car passed, happy to be alive, the runner went on 
while the wrist slowly began to declare its irritation for being treated with such disrespect. Well, there are eight carpal bones in the human wrist along with ligaments and tendons and cartilage and fibrous tissue. These all connect the hand to the forearm, allowing for the muscles of the forearm to work the hand. The hand, wrist, and forearm can make powerful hold and release movements like throwing long and accurate spears or footballs. Pounding or hammering cornmeal or nails and pulling and hauling sheets and lines or wheelbarrows. Those same hands can make that tiny intricate movement like forming small stitches for a garment or a laceration making subtle hand movements for turning the perfect clay jar, painting a masterpiece artwork, and playing the emotional strains of a Beethoven or Beatles piano or guitar rhapsody. The doctor noted the runner's wrist was not deformed like a dinner fork. The dinner fork shape is typical after breaking the radius forearm bone an inch back from the wrist after a fall forward. This type of fracture is the second most common for the elderly next to a collapsed vertebrae. Often balance fails and bones get softer as people get older, making this type of fracture way too common. Balance and bone strength are lost in those who are inactive and preserved in those who regularly stress muscles and bones with movement and lifting. For the runner, X-rays confirm no fracture of the wrist, hand, or forearm, meaning it was a soft tissue sprain and a wrist splint and ibuprofen were prescribed. Take home messages. One, don't run on wet asphalt on steep hills with oncoming traffic. Or, more importantly, don't walk on dangerous spots such as icy walkways or slippery wooden floors with socks and rugs that can slide. Number two, Keep bones strong with adequate vitamin D, enough calcium-rich foods, and regular weight-bearing exercises. And number three, enhance balance by strengthening your legs, arms, and core, the back and abdominal muscles, with daily weight-bearing activities that you enjoy. Well, I sincerely want to thank our guests tonight, Dr. Scott McPherson and Dr. Robert Vandemark. They brought great insight to our questions, your questions, and thank you so much. Thank you. Now on to our flu season update. So far this flu season, we're doing great. There's been 21 cases is all confirmed on the third, by the third week of January. It, may be that this year's flu vaccine is proving to be spot on with the stains, the strains it covers. In previous years, when we started out with few cases, the peaks still went very high, though they were delayed to March or even April. You shouldn't delay, though. If you have not already done so, get your flu vaccine now to reduce your chances of catching the flu bug. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here on call, the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Multiple sclerosis is an unpredictable, often disabling disease of the central nervous system that disrupts the flow of information between the brain and the body. Exploring MS, next time, on call with The Prairie Doc. Funding for On Call with The Prairie Doc is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Avera Heart Hospital, Brookings Health System, 
Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, South Dakota State Medical Association, Swiftel Communications, Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Dog is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc After Hours. We had many great questions submitted beyond what we could answer during the broadcast portion of the show, so let's get started. Uh, patient uh, sent an email, had ulnar surgery one year ago, ulna being the big elbow down to a small part on the wrist. Because of numbness in my little finger and shrinkage of the muscle between the thumb and the pointer finger, there's been no improvement either. Is there still a chance of some improvement? Is there anything that can be done at this point? So I think we talked that potentially it still could get better for up to a couple years. If it's not getting worse and they've had their, you know, surgery, I, it may be one of those things where it not, may not get better and more surgery is not going to help it. help it either. So, so you, can't, you, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. That's right. Uh, I was told by my surgeon that I need to have carpal tunnel sur surgery. He does it under local. I'm deathly afraid of needles and I want to be put out for it. What are your thoughts about carpal tunnel surgery under local only and is the area draped so the patient can't see the procedure, Bob? Yes, you can do uh, with IV sedation uh, and they can cover the patient up like a little tent so uh, they won't know what happened. That's, and that can be done and that's, yep. it's appropriate. Yep. Uh, via email, love the show, I'm 69 and have extreme pain in my thumb, arthritis complicated by bone spurs in the joint, I have arthritis in most of my joints, I'm afraid to have surgery, worried that I won't have fine muscle motion, won't be able to feel with it anymore, so I put up with the pain. Any suggestions? Scott. So there are, you know, conservative things like some of the arthritis creams may be helpful, some type of support splint, but, you know, the, her worries are um, probably not, you know, realistic because normally you do the thumb surgery, you get good motion, you don't usually affect ever the sensory. I mean, most people like it because their pain's gone and their thumb function improves. So it's good surgery. It's, it's good I'm surgery. An internist it's and pretty I've been... predictable and pretty reliable. And conservative things are anti-inflammatory splints, arthritis creams, uh, probably uh, injections. Probably not going to help much in get the, the long surgery. term. Get the surgery. Get the or at least talk to somebody about it. I have a cubital nerve subluxation. Any advice to treat the symptoms of numbness and pain until I can afford the surgery, Bob? Well, that's a good question. That's the the elbow. Yeah. That's the ulnar nerve that comes out of the little finger. Yeah. And they're talking about that it's snap, you know, they flex, it's forth. snapping across your yeah. medial epicondyle there. Get the surgery. I think there's, yeah, you could probably try, I suppose, a net extension splint for nighttime use uh, to keep your elbow out straight, oh, but there's not keep much your elbow else. straight at night. But not during the day, there's not much to do for it, so. Uh, I'm email, I had carpal tunnel release uh, surgery done in both wrists about a year ago. I still get sharp pain sometimes. Why is this? I recently dropped a box I was carrying because it hurt so much. I bet that's that thumb arthritis that follows it sometimes. What do you think, Scott? Well, sometimes even the palm, you know, there are a lot of tiny little nerves or those that the raw edge of that ligament that you cut across. Some people do get some residual kind of palmer pain. I think it's rare. It's I don't know that I always have a good explanation. Uh, for and especially if it's just something intermittent, just happens once in a while, um, you know, you'd probably need to take a look at it, try to localize it. But sometimes, you know, it's like anything we do; it's it's not 100%. It's 
it's close. I mean, it's up there, but uh, you can have some kind of soft tissue injury problem. Or you're right, it could, could be, be that could, could be thumb arthritis that you know that's boom right there, and that can you know really give you a sharp you know poker poker like pain sometimes. Okay, I have pain in both hands at what I assume is the triquium, the little bone at the base of the pinky, top of the wrist on on the underside. The pain is only noticed when I rest my hand's wrist on the steering wheel or bump the hand on that location. I'm a 43 year old woman in Brookings. I've been diagnosed with carpal tunnel in both hands since my early 30s. Splints haven't helped. I wake with numbness throughout the night and have it during the day as well. Also drop things, have weakness in my hands. Could the carpal tunnel be causing the pain in the wrists at the tri tri uh, triquium? I don't think so. You don't think so? So no. it's not carpal tunnel? You well, she have, may have carpal tunnel, but the triquitrum may be a separate issue. Triquitrum. Yeah, and she may even have some. Triquitrum. Triquitrum. Yep. And she may even have some arthritis of that joint too. It's not uncommon. Is there a surgery that you can fix it? Well, usually you can do a cortisol injection and see if that helps, but I think a carpal tunnel is probably the, the most important thing to take care of. Oh. But yeah, yeah something right at that pisiform, that, that between the pisiform and the triquetrum, you can get arthritis there, and that can be you know painful if you load it. So that can be solved by just taking out the pisiform, which you could do at the same time you did your carpal tunnel. So oh. you could maybe get a you know combo kind of thing going there if wow, you take twofer. care of both things. A yep. twofer. Yeah. Yep. 80-year-old from Mitchell, what is the treatment for a ruptured tendon between the elbow and the shoulder? Tendon between the elbow and the shoulder. Is there physical therapy that will be done? How do you treat this, Bob? Uh, it's probably a long head of the biceps rupture, which there's no treatment for it. Uh, usually the shoulder pain gets better after they rupture the tendon. Oh. Uh, John Elway ruptured his long head before this last Super Bowl. And he was still played okay. Brett Favre was hurting. They went and released his arthroscopically before he came to play to the Vikings. So yep. good. Yep. Woman from Brandon, I have arthritis. I have arthritis on my hands, but I also have nodules on tendons, which make them very stiff. Is this a symptom of hand arthritis, or could this be another disease, Scott? So you know, if you're getting nodular type formation associated with arthritis, I mean, it can just be plain old osteoarthritis, but. You worry maybe about something like rheumatoid arthritis if they're actually getting a big, you know, buildup. But to me, it sounds like the nodules they're probably getting are probably associated with typical osteoarthritis. Well, and also, could it be that they're getting Dupuytrens? You know, the it could nodules. Be. The on nodules the there, yeah, that, and that would be not on the palm, right? And that's not arthritis or tendonitis, or so it's just that you're right. Probably those nodules they're talking about palmar nodules getting some you know, Dupuytrens type nodules. Uh, May uh, 67 from Sioux Falls. Will the doctors come on, on Dupuytrens? We just did. Uh, and so you generally use that. You, you guys both use that. Inject, you inject it. I mean, it doesn't require surgery. You do it in the clinic. Right. right. So they have to come back for a manipulation. Um, but yeah, you inject it one day. It's little tuberculin syringe. You're using like 0.39 milliliters. Uh, and then you wait, and wow. they, their hand then looks usually like they caught a fastball, you know, gets yeah. a little bruised, a little swollen, but yeah. then it, it's very gratifying, and Bob would say that too, you know, you numb it up a little bit, and you pull it, and all of a sudden it's just, oftentimes this audible pop as it just goes straight, yeah. and they, they're amazed because their finger hasn't been straight in years, and you know, the people that love it are people who have had previous surgery, and now you offer them this because they said, I'll never do surgery again, and then you do this, and, 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 and from go. a surgical standpoint, doing repeat surgeries on Dupuytrens is, is you don't want to make your living doing that. It is no fun. You get bad yeah. frontal hyperhidrosis, and yeah. you just want to, yeah. so the Zyflex is, hyperhidrosis has been good for us too. 82-year-old Sioux Falls has a trigger finger, any home remedy? Tincture of time. Stretch. <laughs> sure. Leave it alone. Yeah, hook fisting exercises where you just don't make it lock, but just kind of wiggle the fingers like that. And a lot, sometimes they'll just go away on their own. Okay. Fatty tumor on the top of my arm, the size of a silver dollar. Occasionally I have terrible pain in the area. What causes this and what can be done, Bob? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's, uh, the pain is something else. The, yeah. the, the, the yeah. fatty tumor is totally benign. The lipoma should be benign and rarely, yeah. I mean, there's some that give you a little aching, but not, not intense pain, so yeah. somebody should, needs to look at that. And to me, it sounds like there's some kind of nerve association. Maybe it's a, maybe a it's nerve. Maybe it's not a fatty tumor. Maybe it's a nerve tumor. Yeah. 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 I've got a functional fatty tumor on, the back, on my back. 
how do you now what is a functional fatty tumor? <laughs> Don't know. That's one where you say, here, feel this. I've got that same thing you have, and I've left it alone. And you can too. <laughs> it, it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, man from Rapid City, I injured my hand recently and it had a deep cut. I'm worried it might be nicked, uh, might have nicked a tendon. I feel pain on my index finger and worry about testing full range of motion. The wound is healed, but there's still chronic pain. Would it be a good idea to splint the finger and hand? And if so, how long should I wait until I go see a specialist? That's a really good question. I should see somebody right now, I think. Yeah, and my, I would not splint, or no. I, you'd want to keep motion going. And if they have a partial nick, it may be just because the tendon's catching on something. And um, But normally, you know, like about three weeks, if it's a partial, they're, they're starting to, to heal. So it's probably not going to rupture if it's been more than three, three to four weeks. weeks yeah. but, but splinting is probably going to do nothing but stiffen Making the finger. Sure. So keeping motion going. But if you're having the pain, you probably need to see somebody. So I had a patient come in with a Palmer laceration and he had you know he, his, his it was a significant laceration and I was looking down there and it looked I couldn't quite see mm -hmm. so I was just testing yeah. the tenons so I'm having him pull and I'm resisting and then it went pop and it Good ruptured the tendon the oh, we've we've uh, <laughs> we, we have a laceration of right. a tendon but it was going to do that and needed to anyway because that's obviously was near five percent or well, something. well then i was so. a brilliant doctor right. then i did the right thing and, right? and you know that's the thing about it when you get calls people say well, i can't really see in the wound and honestly you don't need to look in the wound you need to examine to the structure the is works. there you know does the flat tendon work does the nerve work you know and yeah. so so it's interesting you test the the squeeze I mean, it's amazing that, that there's a tendon that does that there's a tendon that does this mm -hmm. there's a tendon that does this i mean there are all three of them it's like and then they a great practice they bring them field. in yeah. and then they also bring them out there's yeah. six tendons per finger it's amazing except for the thumb which yeah. there's only four this has to be a post <laughs> so yeah <laughs> uh, so anyway you should see a specialist yep yeah. 70, 67 year old woman from Ipswich. The doctors are talking about pronator nerve on and the elbow, and I think I have it. I have symptoms that feel like I hit my funny bone, and then pain that comes and goes regularly. Can they speak more about the symptoms that this nerve causes? Yeah, the, the, pro, the pronator is a median nerve uh, condition, so that would give you carpal tunnel symptoms, thumb index, middle half of the ring, some forearm pain. And a lot of times it'll have weakness of the thumb joint and the index end joint. Uh, this sounds like more like ulnar nerve if she's got a it funny does. bone symptoms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, lower extremity, a uh, 48-year-old woman from Brandon should consider knee replacement. It hurts more when I sit rather than I stand, and it's always in the lateral sides of the, the knees. Any, any suggestions, Sounds you more, hand surgeons? Like more like a patellofemoral pain problem mm -hmm. and would need to see somebody, but I would say she's probably not in need of a knee replacement, but more likely some therapy to strengthen her patellofemoral joint or maybe, you know, an evaluation she might, maybe an arthroscopy yeah. or something. Needs an x-ray. Yeah. She needs. Yeah, she yeah. needs. Great. So it looks like we're out of our, our questions. We appreciate, we had a whole bunch of them. I appreciate so much you calling us these questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them during the show. Thank you both for your wonderful wisdom. Yeah. And thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunity to answer them. And until next time, from all of us at On Call with the Prairie Doc, stay healthy out there, people. <laughs>